Born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Stayed there till I graduated from the university in 1952 and took off uh, for a job at Bell Aircraft in Niagara Falls, New York. Stayed there for three years, including being married with my bride of over 62 years, Gretel. Uh, I met her my uh, fifth year at the university. I was in aeronautical engineering, which was a five-year course there at Minnesota because their concept was they wanted to turn out engineers who could spell uh, engineering. And uh, so we had a lot of culture courses with our engineering. And in the process, uh, my brother's roommate in high school uh, decided that uh, I should meet his sister. And so they enticed her to uh, go to the University of Minnesota for a year and uh, uh, bribed her to come back from Smith College, which she loved, with a uh, pea green Ford convertible. So that was enough to bring her to try Minnesota for a year. And uh, as a result, we met. Uh, I tried very hard to uh, uh, get to know her by putting uh, secret admirer notes in her P.O. box at the student union, but I didn't realize she never went to the P.O. box at the student union. So I finally met her at the Delta Gamma open house and uh, uh, was very attracted to her. Uh, the first time I saw her uh, come down the stairs into that living room uh, with that very attractive uh, red and gray flannel skirt she was wearing. Just a uh, very special something. I decided I would have to get to know my brother's best friend's sister. Uh, and uh, it was my final year. And so we started dating and uh, decided that this was the right combination. Uh, best we knew how to pray because we were both uh, nominal Episcopalians. What could be better than that, right? Uh, then went into the Air Force, active duty on the Air Force, in uh, Boston. Learned a lot about uh, Whitfield disease and people falling out of the trees listening to them in the Boston Square. It was pretty exciting stuff. And then came back to St. Louis. Uh, all my family said, Missouri? You know how hot it gets in Missouri? Uh, they said that at the time, actually, it was 50 below in northern Minnesota. So I, you know, could take that with a grain of salt. But we loved, loved St. Louis, moved here and became St. Louisans, I'd say. Uh, then lived in Olivet for three years, 30 years, and uh, then moved out to this wonderful farm, Eagle's Nest Farm, out uh, 60 miles north and west, uh, where we had... Uh, a retreat center, some cottages for people to come and minister to, pray with. Uh, just a holy, holy, righteous place. In fact, one of the fun things, I was ministering in a conference out in California, and as we were closing down after the, the program was over, this little lady came running across the, the uh, auditorium and this big smile on her face, and she said, don't leave, I've got to talk with you, I've got to talk with you. You live where the angels live. And I'm going, really? I mean, we didn't normally in our teaching or ministry talk about angels because sometimes that turns people off. But it's true. Uh, the angels did live in a very special way uh, at Eagle's Nest Farm. And so we had quite a talk with this little lady that had discerned that from the distance of the pews in the back of the church. Sort of fun. I've got to say I've been blessed right really from the beginning with uh, godly parents. Uh, my father died when I was two, and so my mother decided that 
Uh, she was going to take care of me uh, and my older brother, two years older, and uh, concentrate on us instead of getting married again, which was wonderful. She was a, an amazing mother-father. And I had uh, two uncles that I absolutely adored. Uh, one was this really sweet Uncle Joe was just one of the nicest guys, and he taught me uh, gentleness, and he had the greatest sense of humor, I think, of anybody I knew. I loved Uncle Joe. And Uncle Ed, on the other hand, was a uh, very, very capable businessman. And, in fact, uh, not sharing any secrets of any kind, but one of his nicknames among his uh, fellow businessmen was Never Pay Full Price Ed. You know, you're just that kind of a guy. And uh, he taught me how to drink scotch and plain water. So things like that were very important to me. Um, my whole life there in Minneapolis was uh, of a tight-knit family. Uh, Uncle Joe and his kids, My, he had two daughters that were dear, close friends of mine. And... Uh, Every Sunday after church, we'd meet at Granddad's or Uncle Joe's or our house. It was a, that kind of a close family relationship. And uh, I have to say that being in one place my whole life added a sense of stability that most of the people we've had the privilege of ministering to just just don't have. And it's it's been a real anchor in my life, the knowing the stability of being in one place surrounded by a loving family. Uh, I know that's the way God wants family to be, uh, but it's going to take some work in the body of Christ to, to help us get to that, I'm afraid. So that's a little bit about my story. I, my brother and I sailed, did quite well in the Inland Lakes Regattas, and were uh, Lake Minnetonka C-class champs uh, a couple of years. And along with my sailing, uh, I did a lot of competitive target shooting. Uh, my apex of my competitive target shooting was winning the New Hampshire state match uh, one year when I was in the Air Force out there. Uh, it was fun to me because as a kid, I'd read about the Green Mountain Boys and the, the, uh, the, the part that they played in the settling of this nation. And uh, for me to go out there and beat these Green Mountain Boys at their own game was really kind of a thrill for me. I'm here taking top expert at the Nationals at Camp Perry. That was fun. That was just really enjoyable. Uh, and I got back here to work at McDonald and got so busy I couldn't find enough time to keep shooting and taking care of my growing family and uh, doing a work at Mac too, so I sort of backed out of that. Uh, I was in customer service, uh, primarily uh, servicing the Air Force needs with the newly uh, uh, operational F-101, the Voodoo. Uh, interesting comment there is that Mr. Mack was interested in spirit realm, and all of his airplanes were phantom, demon, voodoo. And when uh, Sandy became president, the first airplane under his watch was the F-15, which was the eagle. And the verse that he would quote was that Israel was saved by her on the wings of the eagle. And uh, in effect, that was one of the first foreign uh, overseas sales that we had. I did some work on that. I also worked with the uh, 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 corporate jet prototype. The Air Force was uh, buying some airplanes for uh, flying uh, prototype equipment, and uh, they were going to, in effect, be uh, uh, the forerunners of the corporate jet, the Lockheed Jetstar and McDonald's Model 220. And uh, I was in customer service. See, at, at Mac, then, we didn't call ourselves sales because Mr. Mac didn't believe in selling the Air Force. He believed in presenting to the Air Force what he thought they might really need and want and uh, convincing them that that's what they needed and wanted. So it was serving them. So we were customer service, not sales. But uh, in anybody else's language, we were just trying to get them to buy uh, our airplanes because, of course, they were better, obviously. 
Uh, it was a great job, and um, to this day, I'm not sure how the Lord got me to believe that St. Louis needed a new airport enough to leave a really good job, probably the best job I ever had, working for the best person I'd ever worked for, really, uh, to uh, start trying to build the spirit of St. Louis Airport. Uh, I, I didn't really know Jesus then. We knew of him. Uh, it's very interesting in our brand of Episcopalian experience. Uh, it was excellent from one standpoint, and that is that we didn't get a lot of bad teaching about Jesus because we really didn't get much of any teaching about Jesus. In fact, I laugh now because uh, we have a... Uh, uh, we have an expression, a confession in the Episcopal Church that goes something like, I believe in the Father God Almighty and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and then there's something about the Holy Spirit. Uh, it makes me chuckle now because to me and to Gretel and I over these last 40, 50 years of ministry, the Holy Spirit is the means of everything uh, that flows uh, into the world that's good and, and reviving and life-giving. And we had no understanding or even introduction of that uh, as we were growing up, though we were good, solid Episcopalians. And I don't mean to knock and be ugly about any group, but, you know, in, in the Episcopal Church, we read through the Bible uh, during the course of a year, but the whole book of Acts was read in Evensong during August. Well, in Minnesota, good old Minnesotans are out swimming and water skiing in August, and uh, actually quite often even on Sundays. Shame on us, of course. Uh, so I had never really read the book of Acts until the Lord brought us into his kingdom and 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 put the, lap, the Bible in our lap and got us excited about his word. Uh, so when we started reading about what Christianity was all about, uh, we quite honestly went bonkers. And uh, uh, the main thing in our life from that point on was to get together uh, in our home on Monday nights with a group of like-minded people and 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 praise the Lord and worship the Lord and see what the Holy Spirit wanted to do. And uh, that's really how our ministry turning into a little fellowship and then uh, turning into a itinerating all over the world uh, started. But we got to know Jesus through a rather unexpected, unpleasant experience. Uh, we were out at this farm, which we had purchased for a weekend, just so, uh, you know, being a Minnesota kid, I couldn't give uh, our kids the lakes that we had to grow up on, but we could give them woods and hills and creeks. And so we bought this farm uh, about 60 miles out northwest. And uh, we were there in an evening when my uh, oldest son, 11-year-old, uh, started behaving very strangely. Actually, we didn't realize it at the time, but he actually went into a coma. And uh, uh, when we woke up the next morning, uh, he was had just barely stopped breathing. And uh, so I started doing CPR on him, and Gretel got on the phone trying to get an ambulance, but the creeks were all flooded, and the little... Uh, Chevy station wagon that had been converted to an ambulance out there in the country we couldn't get through the creeks. Uh, but in the process of doing CPR on Chris, I said, God, I know you're there. Take years off of my life and give them to this young man of mine. And I literally heard his voice. And he said to me, Paul, I don't want you to ask me to do that because I have plans for your life. And so at that moment, really, for the first time, I knew there really was a God. Yeah. So while I was having that 
meaningful in introduction to the reality of God. Gretel was out uh, in the field just past, past the house uh, putting some sheets out and, to make a cross on the, on the ground because we'd called the, uh, the highway patrol from the airport to come and pick this kid up in a helicopter. And uh, she did a very unepiscopalian thing, even as I had done. She stopped and she said, God, I know you're there, and I just want you to know I believe what's in the Bible. And I, I, I just want to get to know you. And God spoke to her audibly as well. And he said these words of comfort that, that helped us comfort some of our friends, well, who had come to comfort us over this loss. God spoke to her and said, Gretel, the Bible is true, and there is a heaven, and Chris is here with me now, and you will see him again one day. So you can imagine how that brought peace to our hearts. And when we got home, uh, by this time, the, the news had picked up on the fact that the developer of the spirit had a son who had just died and all of this, it was kind of brutal. Uh, but we got home and the house was full of our friends trying to be there to comfort us. And from one to another, we went around with the words of comfort that God had given us. Uh, little did we know, because we didn't know the Bible yet, that Paul says in Corinthians that the comfort we receive from him, we will comfort others with. And uh, so we saw ourselves comforting all those who came to comfort us. And, and that was just sort of a foretelling of what our role was going to be in the following years of ministering, prayer ministering, bringing comfort, inner healing, and, and so forth. Uh, but what it did, it ignited in us a need to know about this God that now we knew it really existed. Uh, whereas in our life before, God was a, a puff of some sort. It's an entity, yeah, a power. But was he real? And, and frankly, if you know God the Father, well, then what do you do with Jesus, you know? I mean, uh, we've got special holidays about him and everything, but it wasn't real to us. So we decided that we would go to every Bible teaching, every study we could, and uh, we started listening to tapes of some of the really great teachers of our time. Uh, Derek Prince, foundational teachings just established on the right track, our, our walk in the Word. Bob Mumford was a, a father in the Lord to us. And then God started bringing uh, people into our lives. We, we read... Elijah Task by John and Paula Sanford. And uh, it so touched our hearts because we'd already been been moved into kind of a, a sense of prophetic flow in the spirit. And uh, so we picked up the phone and called John Sanford and invited him to come to St. Louis. Said, we'll put on some meetings for you. And uh, little be known to us, they're originally from St. Louis. Uh, Paula lived here. So they saw a great opportunity to come home and have a few days at home with the family and, and uh, have a meeting to show for it. And so they agreed, and uh, we got to know them uh, really intimately. We became really like right-hand buddies of John and Paula. Uh, they had us minister at conferences when they were already booked and couldn't uh, couldn't attend. So that was so important. And, th and through John and Paula, we met so many other of the top ministries at our time. Uh, our daughter, Lexi, had a vision of us uh, in a sheepfold. The, Gretel and I were these two little lambs. And in the sheepfold next door were these great, big woolly sheep, mature and uh, majestic. And she said, the hand of the Lord came down and opened the gate to that 
sheepfold next door and sort of shushed us into that sheepfold and closed the gate. And the last part of the vision was these great, big, majestic, woolly, beautiful lambs, sheep, coming around us and comforting us and kind of moving us around. Uh, a, a beautiful picture of what really happened in our walk as we were accepted uh, by some wonderful ministries of God, learned about them. Uh, I've got to just say Dave and Ruth Hatcher right here from St. Louis became such anchors to our faith. Uh, Dave was a the, one of the principal engineering, uh, uh, architectural engineering professors at Wash U, and they had a church in their home. And uh, a wonderful group, day spring, musical people singing worship songs that we'd never ever heard before and could just, just pour out our hearts in, in our love to this God that we'd finally met. Uh, and, and they, they came alongside us. They'd been worshiping and knowing Jesus for years, and we just met him. So they were just awesome helps for us as we started this path uh, into the spirit realm. And it seemed like nothing was impossible with Jesus. Nothing was impossible with the Holy Spirit if we just could keep our eyes focused in the right direction and. We, we couldn't get enough of God's Word. Uh, he started showing us that there were problems in the church that we weren't even aware of and helped us avoid a whole bunch of them. Uh, he also uh, led us to start fellowshipping at New Covenant Church, which was a, uh, a, a boomer, just booming uh, charismatic fellowship here in St. Louis, one of the early ones, uh, where uh, wonderful ministries, uh, worship leaders like Ron Tucker had uh, a bunch of teenage and young 20s and 30 people and a few olders like ourselves uh, prancing in the aisles. And, uh, I can remember the, the night that the Lord finally freed me to do a little uh, jig dance in the aisle and everybody started to cheer because they'd never seen an Episcopalian dance in the aisle before. Uh, and we got uh, baptized in water there, which was meaningful, very meaningful, always had have been since. One of the experiences that you can go through in your walk, because Christianity is to be experiential. It's not just to be theological and theoretical and um, uh, uh, emotional and, and brainy. And baptism is one of those times when you get literally buried with Christ. I can remember driving home from our baptism at New Covenant. It was kind of strange. We were going to another church at the time and uh, our Wednesday night meeting went on interminably that night, of course, the enemy trying to keep us from this appointment at New Covenant. But um, uh, the pastor had announced that at the end of the service there were going to be a group of Presbyterians coming to be baptized. And so the room was still full of, of uh, crazy charismatics at New Covenant. And uh, uh, they wanted to see what uh, Presbyterians looked like. You know? So we walked in and the place was still there waiting for us. We got into the into the baptism mode and on the way home after this amazing experience being buried with Jesus uh, my secretary said to me you know Paul tonight I was buried with Jesus and I was so thrilled because that was what I'd been teaching her you know that what this is all about being buried with Jesus and and yet we live with him and and I just was so pleased that she'd gotten that lesson. And I said, oh, Susie, that's so great that you've got that. No, she said, you don't understand. I was buried with Jesus. And I got excited. Yeah, it's really, that's wonderful. You got it. And she said, no, Paul, listen to me. I was buried with him, and he was there with me face to face in the grave. 
Well, that, uh, that put it in a little different dimension for all of us. And that's what it's supposed to be. That kind of experience with God, the reality of it. I mean, our walk with God, you could say it started because I was raised in a Christian family, but it was a nominal Christianity. But our walk with God started that night, that morning, really, when in agony I cried out to God and he answered me. And you know, when you have experiences like that, there's no way anyone can talk you out of what you know is right. And so my whole thrust now, if I get opportunities to share with uh, pre-believers, is to see if we can not somehow get to the point where they can have an experience with God that is so strong and real that nothing ever would be able to shake them from it. Uh, so we become extremists, don't we? Uh, that does put us on uh, a lot of bad lists. I understand that. But it puts us in a position to participate with what God is doing in the world today that will bring the victory of the church of Jesus. Anyway, I don't, I have to get off my soapbox now. I just, uh, you want to hear a little bit more about my life. And, and uh, I want to, there's some fun things to tell you. Um, if you know the ministry of Derek Prince, you recognize that in the 60s there, in early 70s, when we came into the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit, the church was just beginning to receive teaching from people like Derek about the authority that Jesus had given his disciples over the demonic realm. And uh, I, we, we took this teaching about dealing with demons uh, very seriously, and then the Lord graciously gave us opportunities to experience it during our uh, Monday night services and the, the prayer ministry that followed during the week. And uh, uh, it was an opportunity for me to grow in the reality of the other spirit realm. Uh, I can remember being asked to visit a young man who had received Jesus in the, the, his cell down in the city for some modest crime of robbery and attempted heist that he'd been caught in. And, uh, I went to visit him and remembered the unpleasantness of standing in line to get into the prison down there in St. Louis. The, uh, the unclean smell of the people in line with me was, was a challenge. And uh, I was sort of feeling sorry for myself being exposed to that. When I got home that afternoon, I was mowing the lawn and I pushed my lawnmower in under the spreading branches of this big pine tree in my front yard, and I smelled the same smell. And I thought, now wait a minute, where does that come from? And the Spirit of the Lord said to me that that is the smell of the demonic presence of uncleanness. And so I thought, well, I don't think there's any right for that under the spreading boughs of this beautiful pine in my front yard. So making sure there were no neighbors watching, I stood back and rebuked it in my firmest, strongest voice in the name of Jesus, and then stuck my head back under the boughs, and all I could smell was pine. And one of the first experiences I'd had that we do have authority over these unclean spirits, whatever they are and how they're related, how they're tied together, that poverty has a smell to it, has nothing to do with the person. It's a spirit, and it's the spirit that we in the body of Christ have to learn to help pe set people free from. And it's not always people that have no money. The spirit of poverty can be a spirit of spiritual poverty, and it smells just as bad as financial poverty. So the Lord had 
us learn things that we needed to know in order to be prepared to go and minister itinerant ministry, which we did for 30 years. Uh, I began to believe that true Christianity was a, a force of God that he wanted out in the world, not just in the sanctuaries on Sunday. Uh, or in case like now, the fellowship I belong to on Saturday night, which is a really cool experience. Uh, I had a good friend who wanted an investment and wanted to build a, a building for investment purposes out at the airport, and I helped him get a tenant. And uh, uh, the program was really successful. He was happy, the tenant was happy, until uh, something very untold happened in the business realm, uh, and the tenant went broke. And so my friend was stuck with this building, and of course he had to pay the mortgage payments on building the structure, and he had no tenant to pay him. So I got pretty concerned about it, and um, several times I would have inquiries and show people the building, and they'd, they'd just love the building, and then all of a sudden they'd say, no, it's, no, it's too far out for me. You know, this is way out at the end of the Chesterfield Valley. Well, it occurred to me that the building hadn't moved since they saw it and liked it. So something spiritual was going on. So one afternoon before I went home, as the sun was setting, I went into the building and I just asked the Lord to show me what was going on. And he opened my eyes and literally the walls of that building were crawling with creepy stuff. Things had been done in that building that opened it up to a demonic presence. And with a rod of iron going up my spine, I rebuked it in Jesus' name, and it became clean. And, and even the smell of the place became clean. And within a week, I had a tenant for my friend. So I realized this spiritual gift thing is not just to have fun in the meetings and in our Monday night meetings or in our Sunday morning meetings, but it is to be a weapon to break and undo and destroy the works of the enemy, which Jesus said is one of the callings he has on us as his disciples. And so that was one of the first times we really moved out into the business realm uh, with the gifts of the Spirit. And I'm convinced to this day that more and more of us believers are called to do that and must unhesitating, boldly step forward and enter into that. In fact, I have a, a I probably should stay on published theory. There is built into a lot of us uh, uh, pre-Christianity uh, a great propensity for uh, uh, turning away from the principles of our elders and families. And uh, I think what I'm seeing is that a lot of the older people, the parents people right now, have lived really bum lives. And the kids are seeing it and they're rebelling against their life form and turning to Jesus and his orderliness. It's kind of amazing. I mean, uh, I know of families that are totally out of order, mom and dad, including being divorced. And neither one of them would you really recommend as a parent. But both of their kids have fallen in love with Jesus and are chasing after him. And I think maybe that started by their rebelling against the lifestyle that they saw in their parents. It would be an, kind of an interesting uh, end run of the Lord, wouldn't it? Because the enemy just really trashed some generations. And then all of a sudden, the Lord turns their generations being trashed into the reason their kids are turning to him. It's worth thinking about, don't you think? The reality of the Holy Spirit and the charismata, the charismatic giftings, uh, really 
started way back in 1950, nine o'clock in the morning, written by an Episcopalian, uh, bringing to the forefront, really, uh, in some of the major denominations for the first time in centuries, the reality of the Holy Spirit. And as I used to say, uh, I believe in the Father and the Son, but, you know, what's the Holy Ghost? Uh, we weren't given, uh, we, we weren't blessed by the choice of the words Holy Ghost instead of Holy Spirit because of our connotation to ghost wasn't anything really cool. But in that 50s, 60s, and then in the 70s when the Lord finally got our attention and brought us into the fullness of the Holy Spirit quite rapidly. Our, our experience was upside down. Uh, we fell in love with Jesus. So in the early 70s, charismatic renewal was beginning in St. Louis. And so somebody said, a woman who was an older sister of a friend of mine kept calling me up and says, Eddie, you've got to go out to visitation where there's having this wonderful new Pentecostal Charismatic Renewal. The person who influenced the renewal of Father Francis McNutt, who was a Dominican in those years, and he began to see the fire of the Spirit and began to realize uh, as it hit the Catholic Church in 1967, there was called the Duquesne Weekend. Back in Notre Dame, Catholic priests, nuns, and lay leaders attended the renewal meetings while on campus for continuing education. When they went home, they took this with them. They went all over the United States, they went to Australia, they went to the Philippines, they went to various countries in Europe. So I can remember one night being in that room and hearing a prophecy that I remember this way, fire, fire, fire spreading from east to west. That a vision of what the church could be if the people who were members of the church were really bound together in a deep commitment of love and faith to be servants in the world. We have a, a desire to Oh, to, to influence the church at large uh, with all of the sounds of renewal. And then we got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then because we started understanding his word, now that we had a spirit in us that could help us understand his word as we'd read it, we had to be baptized in water. So we ended up... Uh, at a Wednesday night at New Covenant and got buried with Jesus. Uh, so then, of course, our teenage kids wanted to go to New Covenant on Saturday night where the roof was set on fire a couple of times by the Holy Spirit to the point where the fire trucks even came. You recall situations like that? And uh, it was the Holy Spirit fire, not fire fire. Very amazing, fun stuff. Healings happen, uh, words of knowledge, uh, the gifts of the Spirit flowed because the Holy Spirit was welcomed in that place. And so we started uh, having meetings in our home and it just grew to the point where uh, we couldn't handle more than 80, 85 people. And uh, a couple of pastors from Kansas City came over and met with one of the leading pastors here in St. Louis and said, uh, uh, Paul and Gretel, I think you should let the Lord build a church. He's trying to build a church. And our attitude was, well, there actually is a church on practically every corner in St. Louis at this point. Why would he want another one? And so we, being submissive, uh, agreed to pray about it. And we did pray. And finally, the Lord said to us that he wanted a body of Christ, in a body in the body of Christ that would pray for revival in the St. Louis area to return and to stay. And we thought, well, no, that's a specific that we, we can do that. So we started uh, calling ourselves a church. And when you become a church, you start meeting on Sundays. That's what a church is, right? Well, we kept meeting on, on Wednesdays as well, because that's when the Holy Spirit was so active. Um, and we had prayer for revival every Sunday, one way or another. We also did something else that we were accused of being quite papal. Now, we had communion every Sunday, because we'd learned 
as the Holy Spirit opened the exciting story in, in Exodus about the first Passover, we learned the basic undergirding experience that God's people had with this Passover meal. And we could see that uh, as we'd have our communion service. We'd, we'd experience something very special. The emphasis would be on, on the fact that God uh, had, had the Jews take all the gold and silver out of Egypt when they left, uh, showing that he was going to take care of their prosperity and provision. And uh, we'd have a testimony from one of the people in the fellowship who had just received a car that they needed, a gift just from God. Things like that happened week after week. And uh, so we started seeing experientially again, and I don't want to overuse the word, but how can I? It is so exciting to see God work. Because he really, he re let me tell you, uh, we received a prophetic word one morning. Gretel and I were, were praying. And, and I can remember so clearly, he said, I want you to start looking for my heart in my word and and that that really struck me because he was saying i don't want you to just study the theology i want you to see me in my word and one of the first words that he jumped off the pages at me was first corinthians 1 9 which says god is faithful i kind of that's a good way to start a word isn't it god is faithful who's called you to fellowship with his son jesus christ and I got really excited about that because in that phrase, he's called me to fellowship with his son, I got a, a sense of a very strong, intimate friendship with Jesus, not just fellowship. And I got so excited that I called the, uh, the, the assistant pastor who had just come out of a seminary and was a spirit-filled man and knew he'd understand and shared this my excitement over what I'd heard in that word as he opened it to me and he got all excited because then he had a, a an audience to hear him talk about the six or seven meanings of the word koinonia which is translated fellowship and and uh, I'm sitting there going oh you know he <laughs> he doesn't get it <laughs> I don't I'm I'm not into this Greek word study about koinonia because what I'd really heard the Holy Spirit say to me is that God had called me to be a buddy with Jesus, a, a, a pal, a, a real friend, a buddy. And, you know, I, I, I almost want to interrupt him and said, do you know the Greek word for buddy? You know, but I was nice at the, in those days. I probably would today, but I didn't then. But the Word of God has in it His heart for us. And it's so much deeper, usually, than just the words that we have. And I've always felt that as we experienced His Word, of, of course we, we really feel, as we were anchored in it by people like Derek Prince and Bob Mumford, that it rules and reigns all of our experiences. Uh, and, and we don't have to have a chapter and verse for everything because there's a marvelous verse at the end of the book of John that says, if everything Jesus did was written in books, the world couldn't hold all the books. So uh, that's my chapter and verse for some of the people that challenge things that I say I've taken out of the scripture. But his heart is what he wants us to see in it. And sometimes that takes a little digging, but it's worth it if we keep asking, now, what does this show me about you, Father? What does this show me about you, Jesus? And what does this show me about you, Holy Spirit? Because see, the challenge today really is getting the Holy Spirit back in the place of prominence in the body of Christ when we gather together because he really has not been honored in recent years in, in, in many churches. There are those that do, thank you, Lord, uh, 
we tried to, and we know some that are even today, marvelously honoring his presence. And the results are that people are starting to grow into an understanding of a supernatural life available in Christ Jesus. But the question is, where is Jesus now? Jesus is at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places. And so then who is it that's in our presence? It's the Holy Spirit of Jesus. So how can we worship and flow with Jesus without recognizing the reality, the person of the Holy Spirit? Bringing that back into the church today, and that is what's going to break loose into revival in the bodies of Christ, and then the renewal of what the body is really supposed to be as revival unfolds. That's my, my prayer. Uh, we prayed for six years as a, as a body of Christ that Holy Spirit would break through once more in St. Louis. Spiritual history of St. Louis is so rich. There have been giants in the faith here in St. Louis. I believe that God is renewing the strength in the body of Christ and going to start bringing unity in the faith as well. Well, I've just <clears throat> just expressed uh, my heart's desire for God's move here in my adopted city of St. Louis. Uh, there was a time that really a, a great move of the Holy Spirit here, the charismatic uh, uh, spirit uh, raised up some very strong leaders in the Lutheran churches. And uh, Francis McNutt in the Catholic churches. And, and I, think, I think basically most of us were one place or another almost every night of the week. Uh, if it was uh, flowing with the things of God was open, the chances are we would be there. And the people we knew were there. Uh, in fact, I can remember going to a meeting of Francis McDutt, who was teaching on healing. and uh, They had a what they called a, a, a co-presentation, a co-service of their mass. And uh, being totally naive about Catholic things, I felt uh, co-ministry meant that we could all partake in their Mass. Well, it doesn't mean that. It means that they have more than one priest serving the Mass. Uh, so when we stood up in line, all of our charismatic Catholic friends were going, yay, hallelujah, you know, they've joined us now because uh, by their uh, strictures, if you partake of their Mass, you are proclaiming your uh, the authority of the Pope over the body of Christ. Uh, since we didn't know that, uh, when we found it out, we were released from that. But the fact is, there was a sense of unity in the body of Christ, in the people, that transcended some of the divisions that uh, leadership and the different clans within the body had established. And I'm not sure that that is still the case. Uh, in the great charismatic meeting over in Kansas City, which was, what, 75, 77? 77. Uh, there was a word from the uh, Word of God uh, community uh, that said, basically, the body of Christ is broken. And it was the Holy Spirit crying for unity and healing in the body of Christ. And the idea was that from that point on, all of these different charismatic branches of the various church organizations would, would start coming together and the churches themselves would come together. But what actually happened was that each one of those charismatic parts of the different church organizations became more separated. Uh, the Midwest 
charismatic Catholic conference was a large, large meeting for years and brought some marvelous ministry here into St. Louis. Uh, but the last year they had it after that message, we, uh, Gretel and I were uh, showcase Protestants. We had a workshop. Now, I accepted a workshop invitation. I thought, well, that would probably be 10 or 12 anyway. Jesus had 12, so we'll have, you know, 12, maybe 24 people at our workshop. There were almost 3,200 people in our workshop because that's the scope of the magnitude of that, those conferences, and they were great. Uh, we had a, an experience of ministering in tongues together that was, I, I just have to share when I talk about it. It was so beautiful. Uh, Gretel and I weren't teaching together at that point yet, but when I had finished my incredibly wonderful teaching, of course, I had the sense that uh, we had some ministry, so I called Gretel to come up to be by my side, and uh, she brought forth a word in tongues, which was so dynamic I just, I felt like I'm just, I'm just going up right now. I mean, this is really awesome. It was so anointed. And yet what I was hearing was kind of a, what we used to call a little nini niny noony blessing word. Now, that's not very respectful, but you get the idea. What I was hearing her say in this incredibly anointed tongue was, I see you, my precious little sparrow, dressed in brown and looking about and seeing all of the peacocks in their bright and shining colors. And I just want you to know that I see you and I love you. And as I heard that word unfold as she spoke in tongues, I'm sitting there saying to myself, that, that's, you couldn't be saying that, Lord. The, the anointing on this is so strong. This has got to be a, called a battle or something. But uh, out of just stubborn obedience, which at that point I was still learning, I repeated what I'd heard. And at that point, way in the back of the room, this little gal fell over under the power of the Holy Spirit. And fortunately, she fell into the arms of one of the gals in our fellowship uh, who brought her up after the meeting to explain what had happened. She brought up this little lady, and she was in a brown habit. She had just arrived from Ireland the day before. She was a little Irish nun, and she was placed in amongst these people, the, <laughs> sorry, the peacocks in all of their fancy garb and everything, and she was feeling so alone and so small and so tiny. And what she said was this, when your wife spoke, she spoke in my grandmother's Gaelic. And when you interpreted, you actually translated word for word, my grandmother's Gaelic. And I knew that God saw me. And you know, that kind of experience does something in your heart. I mean, if that doesn't move you, you probably need a heart transplant right now. It's, that's. But heck, what goes on when, when you see God move like that and, and set that precious little lady back on her feet and establish her uh, in her position with Jesus, with God the Father, uh, in the midst of all of the strange and wonderfulness. And uh, I'll never get over that. It was, it was so beautiful. <laughs> Gretel. Jesus, the greatest gift to me in my life, his lordship over my life, the next greatest was Gretel. And Jesus ends his discourse to Nicodemus by telling him, he who practices the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought by God. He who practices the truth of kindness will have his deeds illuminated by God himself one day and receive the praise for having been a faithful servant to the Lord of Lords.
To be kind is to be considerate of other people's feelings and being willing to be inconvenienced for them in their needs. Um, I tell a story about Gretel when she was a little child. Uh, she spent a summer up in way far north Minnesota at her granddaddy's uh, place. And uh, he was a, uh, a great man, and he loved gardening. So he plowed a plot uh, in this sandy soil and planted, helped Gretel plant uh, uh, potato eyes because the potatoes grew beautifully in that sandy soil. And Gretel was so excited to have her own potato patch that almost every morning she'd get up and dig up the roots and see how big the potatoes were getting. And uh, Granddad didn't scold her for it. He let her do it day after day. And, and because potatoes do like being cultivated, uh, her potato bushes were huge, the biggest potato bushes he'd ever seen, he said. But when it came time for harvest, uh, she dug up the potato plants, and the potatoes were about the size of an overgrown pea because she hadn't left them alone long enough in the soil to mature and grow into potatoes. And we used to jo joke about that, that the, the love of this granddaddy uh, allowed his granddaughter to dig up the potatoes when he knew she shouldn't because he wanted her to learn patience. We call it potato patience in our family. And, and I've been the beneficiary of potato patience in Gretel because uh, in, in, in retrospect, it took Gretel a lot of patience to live with me for 62 years. And it was uh, infectious because it took a bit of patience for me to live with her uh, for 62 years. The, the unity that God put between us was unique. When we were married, the uh, vicar, Anglican vicar, was from uh, Canada, married up in uh, Virginia, Minnesota, northern Minnesota. And when he had finished the wedding service itself, he took his uh, el, uh, elb off and he, he had us put our hands together and he wrapped that around our hands and tied us together. And with a few words said, uh, in the name of Jesus, I bind you together, even as I wrap this cord around you forever. You are joined together. And there was something transmitted to us in that process that through many very exciting experiences prevent us, us from ever even considering not working things out and staying together. Because when you come together and work things out, you grow stronger and you grow wiser and you develop the fruit of the Spirit, which includes patience. Uh, and so when I would do weddings, I would always do that. Now I didn't have any of the proper clothes, but I'd take my necktie off and wrap it around and tie it tight and say, the appropriate words of binding them together together so that the picture I have is being yoked with Jesus. Being yoked with Jesus, we're yoked together together on one side of the yoke and Jesus is on the other side of the yoke. So all we have to do is to stay in cadence and step with each other as we let Jesus lead the way from the other side of the yoke. And that picture probably exhibits my understanding of our relationship more than, than anything else I've, I've come up with. Uh, there were times when Gretel and I were uh, <clears throat> challenged greatly because we both were the second sibling and our older brothers, as I'd mentioned before, uh, roommates in, in high school, really good buddies, and, and I loved her brother. He was a great guy. But they were both very, very smart. 
very, very strong personalities. My brother, of course, becoming the man of the family at age four, that did something in him. But as a result, neither one, neither Gretel or I were ever able to be right. I mean, even when we were right, we couldn't be right because that wasn't right for us to be right. We were the little kids. So when we got married, there were times when Gretel would come up with a suggestion. And I would say, oh, I don't think that's a very good suggestion. And yet, at the same time, it was almost like I'd be over here looking at myself saying that and wondering, well, why are you saying that? What's wrong with that suggestion? But I was, I was responding to her expectation to never be right, which she had learned from her brother. And she would be doing the same thing with me. So we prayed through that. John Sanford helped us understand this is a, a bitter root thing that needs to be uprooted and taken out of our lives, which we did. And then we, of course, had another problem because in order to walk in that, every time she'd make a suggestion, I felt honor bound to Jesus to agree with it. So we did some dumb things. Uh, but then we got to the point where yet we were free to say we disagreed or agreed. We didn't feel we had to agree. We were free to disagree and agree. But we worked through things like that over the years so that now, uh, now that her brain is being compromised by Alzheimer's, I see so clearly her spirit isn't compromised. Uh, her mind is damaged but her spirit isn't. And so I'm with her, she's full of joy and peace and surrounded by people who are struggling, as you know, with the very mean disease of Alzheimer's because the difference between spirit and soul is so very, very real. The spirit is in charge. The soul, the emotions, the intellect, the brain can be damaged, but the spirit can still be in control and walk in harmony with the Holy Spirit. And probably the greatest gift that God gave Gretel was uh, hospitality. It, it is a Holy Spirit gift, as you know. Uh, by some, you entertain angels without knowing it, but Gretel has the ability to, to break even the most stiff-necked with a hug. Uh, one of, we spent a week over in one church in Wales. We ministered to all of the elders in this body. And uh, they were just absolutely precious young people, 20s and 30s year olds, and wonderful Holy Spirit people of God. And when we were leaving, the wife of the head elder came up and gave Gretel a hug. And then she stepped back and she said, Gretel, I want you to know that I've never ever hugged anybody but my husband until you came along. And now I want to hug everybody. <laughs> and they even have a special word that they use that means hugs to them. But there is a resistance of the people in that small island, tons and tons of people in a very small area, and they have this very small private area. But Gretel didn't know that even existed. Uh, I was not a great uh, uh, buff of the uh, media, uh, Christian media, as a matter of fact, but I, I really sensed in my heart that I'd like to be able to get some of the uh, uh, some of my teaching uh, on the radio. So I called up the station, and sure enough, they had a, a quarter of eight time slot, which is pretty good in the morning. And uh, so we prayed about it, and I made a dicker with God. Is that okay to say that? Made a deal with God uh, because I wanted to make sure that there was nothing in me that was. Uh, ego driving this whole thing. So I said, Lord, if you want me to be on the radio, I'll be on the radio, but I'm just going to be Brother Paul. I'm not going to be 
uh, Paul Haglin of Eagle's Nest Fellowship or anything, just Brother Paul, and uh, see what happens. And uh, that seemed to be acceptable to him. So we started uh, early 70s. I was on for 13 years, uh, five days a, a week. Uh, and uh, I ended up the last two years, I went through the uh, <coughs> Gideon schedule of reading the New Testament over a period of years. So I went through the New Testament uh, <coughs> completely, had that in all series. But basically what I did was to take some of the messages that the Lord had given me for our fellowship. Uh, and, it, and it was totally unseminarian because the seminary teaches that you have three points and you you don't ever just stay subjective. You exegete the precious word of God. And there's value in that. I don't knock it. But I sense what the body of Christ usually needs is an answer to some of the problems they're facing. And as we started ministering broader than just in our living room and and even around the state as we went overseas, I found that one of the main things the body of Christ needed was comfort and how to comfort one another. And we found the teaching, basic undergirding teaching of our whole series was how to comfort one another and how not to comfort sin, which is kind of important. And that's how we started in the radio program. I would take the teachings that God had given us uh, during the meetings during the week and break them into our 14-minute uh, segments and put them on the radio. And uh, I was just known as Brother Paul. I had a very interesting experience in 1975 where I had a perforated ulcer and I was bleeding to death. Uh, the symptoms were shielded from me because everybody had the flu, and I was feeling kind of flunky, but I thought, well, I've just got the flu like everyone else, <clears throat> until I threw up coffee grounds, and I knew that was a sign of something not good going on inside. And uh, when I passed out going to the breakfast table the next morning, I, I realized something else was wrong. So we ended up in the hospital, and uh, sure enough, there was a bleeding ulcer, and they uh, cycled like 13 pints of blood through me while they were trying to get things stabilized for an operation. And uh, it was a test of faith because we had been used so mightily right from the beginning to heal. We, when we'd be called to pray for someone, uh, the Holy Spirit would show up and bring healing. <laughs> I remember Randy Clark saying, don't give up praying for cancer until you've prayed for at least 100 people. Well, the first time Greta and I left the house to pray for somebody to be healed was a cancer patient. And when we got to her house, she was on this cot in the living room, and, and you could almost see through her. She was almost translucent. She was hadn't eaten for weeks and was sort of on the way to the Lord, I guess. And we didn't know what to do, except I remembered there was something about healing in the 103rd Psalm. So we read the whole 103rd Psalm to her and laid our hands on her and blessed her in Jesus' name. And uh, then we got up to leave. And as we got up to leave, she got up and walked over to the refrigerator and said to her, uh, her daughter, don't you have anything in here for me to eat? <laughs> and it turned out that the Lord totally raised her up from her next to death bed, uh, healed her from cancer. So that was our experience with healing. And here I'm in the hospital. I don't have faith for a wonderful man to cut me open with a knife. We have faith for God to heal me. So we uh, took an extra uh, 12 hours of prayer, just Gretel and me, and uh, finally decided that, yeah, we needed to have the operation, which they proceeded with, and everything went very, very fine. Uh, took a few weeks to recover, as you might guess. My first real experience with that side of healing and uh, it did a lot in our understanding of who God is because we tend to get hold of a truth and hang on to it at the expense of any other shades of that same truth. And so we have to deal with a lot of our brothers and sisters who have, for one reason or another, come into a almost an enmity 
with the medical people who God has shown how to minister healing and wholeness to the bodies that he designed. And uh, so we found that part of our ministry was in breaking down those barriers. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that uh, Randy Clark, for primary example now, is bringing the medical believing community and the Holy Spirit faith healing community together to work together, which is uh, where I believe God really wants us to be. So how did I get started on that? We were, uh, I guess, maybe talking about Gretel. One of the things that, that Gretel did in that particular time was to spend every waking hour with me in the hospital room. Uh, I was never awake, but that she was there by my side. And uh, it's indescribable to t try to tell how that affects your spirit and your soul. And uh, I, I realized that, that that was exactly what I felt when she was having her first baby. We were in Boston. I was just a first lieutenant in the Air Force and didn't know anybody and we were in this huge Boston hospital and Gretel was having difficulty and uh, I stayed in her room though I wasn't supposed to uh, to be at her side day and night until she had that precious little baby. That's the kind of joining together that we had. It was God and it was really good and he further blessed us along those lines by, by joining others together when we would perform a marriage. Uh, it was a supernatural, very precious thing, and I'm very grateful for it. Uh, we have some couples around the country right now who we performed that service to, and they've, they've all witnessed to the fact that the Holy Spirit of God put them together in a very special way and that's their witness. And it's, it's so good to hear from them sometimes that, that God is still working with them in that very, very special way of being one in the Spirit together. Uh, I started to say she hugs. She brings healing with her hugs. You know what, I, what little kitty mo kitties do? Uh, if you have a, a room of people and there's someone there who doesn't like cats, a kitty will find them and jump up in their lap. And that's exactly what happened in our Monday night meetings as people would come. And then pretty soon, that person who had been adopted by this rambunctious kitty would start expecting the kitty to jump up into their lap and he'd get the purrs and he had a chance to pet. And then of course there were the others who wanted the pet too. And so the kitty had to make their rounds. Uh, it's sort of that way with hugs. You have people that have not had a holy hug. And when they receive one, they feel that transmission of holiness and real love just through a hug. And they want more of it. And then they realize that they can pass that on. And that was one of Gretel's great gifts hospitality, hugs. We had people standing in line to get her hugs. And I believe that's the way it ought to be in the body of Christ as we support each other. And that's one of the reasons that the Lord had us concentrate on words like uh, forgiveness. You know, it's Actually, just recently, I've realized that <clears throat> when Jesus was resurrected and came into that room where the disciples were collected, whether he came through the closed door or walked through the walls, we don't know, but he appeared in their midst. And, uh, and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them. And then the first words of his ministry instruction to them was, in the area of forgiveness. He said, those sins that you forgive here on this earth are forgiven in heaven. And it has struck me that the first instruction that Jesus gave his disciples was 
on forgiveness. So it's got to be important. It's got to be a keystone of our ministry. Not only teaching how to forgive, but forgiving. And as a disciple of Jesus, using his words, saying, I forgive you. And because as a disciple of Jesus, I forgive you, know by Jesus' own words that you are forgiven in heaven. And when we would say that in the course of a ministry prayer time, you could see the results of the heart being freed and full forgiveness being entered into. So I can't overemphasize that. That's something we learned in our, in our ministry was absolute key to walking in freedom in Jesus, was being a forgiver and teaching others how to forgive and then the other side is receiving forgiveness. So that's part of the story of how our ministry unfolded. And uh, When we moved out to the farm in 1981, uh, we sort of lost track of what was going on here in the city. We started to travel uh, first in the States and then over to England. We would spend four to six weeks in England every year after that. And uh, uh, the flow of, of hugs, forgiveness, dealing with disappointment uh, were absolute rocks in our conversation with the body of Christ over there. We would come home and tell our friends how strong the body of Christ is in England. And they'd say, well, I just had some friends come back and they'd say, the church is a mess. I said, well, yeah. But you could say that about a lot of our churches, too, couldn't you? Well, I said, where we were led by the Lord, the people of God were way ahead of us in some areas of righteousness and holiness, and way ahead of us in some areas of intercessory prayer. Because if you remember the days of Dunkirk during World War II, where the king proclaimed a day of national prayer, for the first time, as far as anyone knows in history, the, the North Sea Channel, the North Channel became as smooth as glass, so that even little fishing boats from the shores of England, southern shores of England, could go over to France and pick up a soldier or two and bring them over uh, and free them uh, from Dunkirk. Uh, and at the same time, the Lord provided a, a cloud cover so that the German fighters couldn't even fly over and machine gun them from the air. Total mi miracle of provision, of rescuing 300 plus thousand British troops from Dunkirk because the British Channel was as smooth as glass. We had witness to the other side of the English Channel. Some friends of ours took us over to Belgium for a beautiful weekend. And on the way back, there was a very strong wind. In fact, the, uh, the ferry that we were taking was questioning whether they could make the crossing. But the captain had a boatload, and he decided he was going to do it anyway and sort of went down along the shore and then scooted right across to Dunkirk. And on the way across to Dunkirk, the waves were so large that this huge ferry boat, actually some of the cars broke loose and were rattling around in the hold, up, up where the people were. At one point, this, this chest of uh, glassware from the bar flew open and all the glasses flew on the floor and had this huge crash and people were getting sick all over the place. And uh, we were kind of concerned because we had a full schedule that next night that we were to get home and start ministering. Uh, but the captain said that he was going to try to make it into the harbor at Dover. Uh, we incidentally had uh, our hosts were really very much on the ball. And they did something for us maybe you're not aware of. They gave us candy ginger to suck on, which kept us from having the least bit of seasickness where everybody all around us were having real problems. We were just enjoying our candy ginger. So you might want to keep that in mind if you're going to take a boat trip someday. And the captain made it into the harbor, the last boat to make it in the harbor for three days. 
You can imagine what that would have done to our ministry schedule if we hadn't made it into that uh, at that particular time. So we've had a lot of fun, exciting things like that. And again, going back to Gretel, all I can say is when we experience things like that together, the most amazing thing happened because every time something like that untoward would happen, we would be drawn to God to give thanks to Him. There never was any thought of, God, you've let us down, or shaking your fist at God. You know, unfortunately, we've ministered to folks who've got a, a real grudge against God over a lot less than we've gone through. But it was because the Holy Spirit was always drawing us to Him, no matter what the circumstances were. In fact, my daughter coined a phrase, we were up in northern Minnesota uh, with my in-laws. And you got to understand, Gret's dad was a car buff. He knew everything about cars. He was a mechanic, and he loved cars. And we were up on this road, way up in the wilderness area, when our van stopped. And that was not the right thing to do in front of Gret's dad, you know. But I got out, and I did what I knew to do. I kicked the tires and walked around and opened the hood and looked like I knew what I was looking for got back in the car and we started to wonder if we'd ever be found out here in this wilderness area. And Lexi, from the back seat, said, aren't we having a fun adventure with Jesus? And she took the hands of Philip and uh, Ted and climbed out of the car and said, hey kids, let's go see what treasures God has hidden for us to find in this adventure with Jesus. And frankly, between you and me, adventure was not the word that was going through my mind at this point, because I knew that my father-in-law was thinking, uh, this kid took proper care of this car. It wouldn't stop in the middle of the road, you know. Well, it turned out it was some water in the gas filter, and you know what happens then. But Eventually, I think about an hour later, a ranger came by and announced that 50 miles down the road was a station, and when he got there, he would let the man know that we were stuck. And so a couple hours later, he came back and fixed our nice little fuel filter for us, and off we went. But that expression became a mantra for our family. Whatever happened, we were having an adventure with Jesus. Well, with our propensity for England, of course, we read some uh, books uh, uh, that uh, had expressions known only to the English. And one of them was that an adventure is a, uh, uh, a discouragement properly considered. Uh, and a uh, discouragement is an adventure improperly considered. And so we realized that uh, Lexi had coined a phrase that uh, men of God before her already had put in print. So we, you know, had to handle our pride in this new thing a little bit gently. But that is a wonderful word to remember. Everything that happens can be an adventure with Jesus or a terrible burden to try to handle yourself. So I mean, just Take your pick. What do you want? Well, we've always picked adventure. And, of course, leaving a good job at Mac to build an airport, I mean, what could be more of an adventure than that, right? That's been our life. This book is uh, uh, contains some of the main teachings that we think the body of Christ could learn and grow and start maturing with. And its the title is Contagious Godliness, which was given to us by Verna Tompkins. Uh, when we came up with our final uh, uh, copy, we submitted it to some of our dear uh, peers, Iverna being one of them. And she said in her report of it, that uh, her recommendation for it, if, if I were given a choice, I'd pick the name Contagious Godliness. Uh, up till that point, we'd always thought we'd have something like experiencing personal transformation, because that's what this is. Uh, how to deal with forgiveness when you don't want to, and things like that. But 
Contagious Godliness stuck. It became the name of this book, and we're delighted to say that we're just about to approach our second printing of it, uh, get a few more uh, home groups using it as a study guide. We'll have to get some more. It's, uh, uh, I, I've got to say, it, it's really, don't you think? That's one of the prettiest books you ever saw. Well, I think if you read it, you'll enjoy it too. We've had some awesome response uh, to people who have read it, and uh, we thank God for it. It's basically some of the main teachings that we feel the body of Christ needs to move into maturity. Uh, it ends with a chapter on godly giving, and the final chapter is on communion. The details, the meat that's beyond, uh, that's the undergirding of the experience we should have when we take the body and the blood of Jesus. And that has uh, affected a lot of people that they've let us know. Uh, they didn't ever realize. They almost took communion like cookies and juice in the Sunday school. And, of course, that's not what it is. Uh, we wrote the chapter because he put on our hearts when we would meet, we would have communion. And, and he also put on our hearts that communion, as we know it, is primarily for us individually. Our older son was having a very difficult time uh, balancing his acceptance and Com commitment to Jesus with the temptations of the world. And uh, one night, as we were preparing for bed, the Spirit of the Lord put in my heart that we were to have communion the next morning when we woke. Uh, now, being Episcopalian, you've got to understand whatever group that you were raised up in, you have a, a certain respect for the traditions of your uh, your belief. So we got out our prayer book so we could do it right. And I got a little cup of wine and a cracker and put it by the side of the bed. And the next morning we woke up and, and read through the communion service and did it quite proper. And were, uh, I guess the expression I would have used then was, we were blessed out of our socks because the Holy Spirit actually ministered Jesus to us in a way we had never experienced before, just the two of us at home. So we got up to wake the kids up, get them ready for school, and as we stepped out of our bedroom door, our son's door was open and his window was open and the curtains were blowing out the window and he was gone. Uh, that was the first time he'd run away. And we stood there hand in hand totally immersed and wrapped in the peace of God because he'd prepared us for it by giving us the body of his son and covering us with his blood. And he took care of him on that particular venture. He came home a few days later, a bit wiser. And then we realized that the Bible actually says in Exodus 12 that the first thing is for the family. And then, then if the lamb is too big, you invite your neighbor to come in, so it's neighborhood as well, and then becomes a community thing. And we've been familiar with communion, mass, whatever it is you want to call it, uh, on a corporate level, but never as an individual, never as a family thing. And yet, that's what God first said. And I want to just say, as an aside to this, and it's an important aside, if you read in Exodus 12 about the first Passover, the, the initial plan for the final Lord's Supper that became our communion service, it says, if the lamb is too big, call in your neighbor. Nowhere in our scripture referring to Passover or the communion does it talk about the lamb not being big enough. And that's a point, beloved. God is always more than enough. You don't have to worry 
about running out of the Passover lamb, Jesus. Our Passover lamb, Paul says, is always enough. There's always enough to invite your neighbor to bring in the community, but it's first and foremost was for the family, the individual. And that's a point that we've tried to make during the year. Uh, as we teach, we try everywhere we go, would we have a series of teachings, we would try to end with communion and have the couples serve each other. And where there weren't couples, where there were folks without couples, they, we would have them come up and we as a couple would serve them to emphasize this call of God to come and partake of Jesus as family, as individuals. And the difference that it made in the folks that we saw partake it that way for the first time was immense. And then we knew that we were on the right track. Well, I, I just want to add something here about the, back about the flow in the Holy Spirit, the importance of tongues and just being free in the Spirit. And as an example, I was meeting with a young man, uh, I won't say discipling, but uh, we were friendshipping in Jesus together, and uh, he brought one of his friends from out of town, and we had a beautiful time together, and as we always did when we met, uh, we had communion. And uh, in the tr Jewish tradition of uh, Passover, when they had completed the Passover meal, they would enter into a Praise the Lord song. They'd call it an LL, and, and maybe some of our Jewish listeners know what I'm talking about. But as, as we were sitting there enjoying the sense of the presence of the Holy Spirit from having shared communion together, this brother started to sing in the Spirit. And it was so right on. And my, I don't remember being that blessed by the Spirit for a long, long time. And I knew that right then and there that he was a very special man of God that I'd been really blessed to have in my home. And I remember that night dearly. Uh, even though my other friend is now with Jesus, which is not something to be uh, worried about, I, I have a pleasure of meeting with that friend once in a while, and I'll never forget that particular night when his Holy Spirit led him to burst into a praise that led both of us into a, a degree of worship of the Lord that I'd never experienced before. I'm in a position now of uh, of being an older. Uh, I've never really been an elder. I've just been older. And because we were older when we came in uh, to the things of God, uh, the Holy Spirit put a lot of uh, uh, patience in the hearts of uh, some of the men and women that we worked with who had uh, gone through the agonies of being properly trained in seminary and so forth. In fact, I even remember one of my dear friends saying to one of his dear friends who was questioning him a little bit about who we were, uh, and his saying, well, you know, you've got to understand, give him a little leeway. When somebody doesn't even come in to know Jesus till after he's 40, you've got to expect to have him a bit enthusiastic about it. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's probably true. It's the best way to try to explain some of our uh, behavior, if you want to say it that way. Um, but I, I don't think in terms of uh, what to be known as. Uh, the biggest joy I get right now is when I receive a note or an email or a uh, contribution even to the ministry that I'm still doing. Uh, from someone I ministered to 40 years ago that said, I received it yesterday in the email, I'll never forget you and your wife ministering together in my church down in Arizona. 
And he said, I could see you, Paul, praying in tongues, sort of under your breath while Gretel was ministering, and she would pray in tongues under her breath when you were ministering, and it was like a constant flow of the Holy Spirit, in whichever one of you was actually speaking uh, the word. And he said, I have just received a word from the Lord himself telling me that he wants me to, to try to do what Paul said that we should be constantly praying and praying in the Spirit. And I'm, I'm starting to try to pray in tongues quietly or under my breath more and more of the time. And I am seeing something very major taking place in my heart as I do this. It's like I'm opening a door to my spirit that somehow I've managed to keep shut all these years. And I'm experiencing a depth of the Holy Spirit's presence in my spirit that I haven't experienced before. And I got that letter because uh, he was moved to just pick up an email and, and write me a thank you note. And I hadn't seen him or heard from him for 40 years. That's uh, the kind of blessing I'm experiencing now. The frustration is some of my dear friends come up and say to me, as I'm approaching my 86th birthday uh, next week, and saying, well, you know, uh, your end years, your final ministry will be so much better than your early years. And there's some scriptures that indicate that. And my response is, oh my goodness, <laughs> without having the foggiest idea of what that means, I have to be nice and accept and thank them for blessing me with that word. But at the same time, uh, I kind of wonder, Lord, do you really have something for me at this point? And, uh, and he has just recently had me accept the fact that he does. And so right now I'm in the process of shedding a few, uh, more than a few, unnecessary pounds, uh, trying to get my muscular structures uh, working better uh, with one of the neurological uh, unpleasantnesses I'm going through and uh, be available to him for whatever he has in mind. Uh, I don't think of legacy uh, I, I kind of laugh when I hear a lot of talk about legacy these days, particularly politically, because I think some of the legacy that God sees in some of our famous people today would not be the kind of legacy any of us would want him to see in us. But if I had my choice of a phrase on my tombstone, I would like it to just simply be a man of God. To me, that would be the highest possible compliment. Thank you, Lord. You've taken us two kids from the Midwest and taken us around the world to meet and share with your people. And we've learned so much of you from them. And we've been blessed to leave with them some things that you showed us that have blessed them. How can I possibly say thank you for all of them? 